Hi guys, things are kind of rough personally at the moment, which is why I might seem a little out of it and I'm, I'm sorry for that. But similar to a few weeks ago where I couldn't brush over the global pandemic, even more so now, I can't leap into a book discussion without acknowledging the Black Lives Matter protests that, that have happened globally now, largely in response to the absolutely brutal and, and racist murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmed Arbery, or I guess specifically in the cases of Floyd and Arbery, it's the reaction to the release of some of the most horrific footage you'll ever see. And the fact that it took um, the release of that footage to inspire this level of collective outrage is in itself outrageous. Not to be that white girl quoting Toni Morrison, but it's almost unearthly how articulate she was when she was asked about race in interviews. Would be nice if white writers were similarly asked more often about the role of race in their books, but mm. anyway, I was watching a video of Morrison a few days ago in which she said, guilt is of no use to anyone, responsibility is. And she wasn't even talking about racism necessarily, but in that spirit, I'm not going to berate myself on camera, not because I don't deserve it, but I, I don't see how that's very useful for you guys. The fact that this is maybe the second time on my channel that I've mentioned police brutality since I started in 2016 says more than anything I could say here. But I am going to leave links to ways that you can act if you're like me and, and looking for things to do beyond reading and self-educating, as important as, as those are and as long-term as they are. And, you know, of course the real test of all of these commitments to, to read more diversely or to, to engage in anti-racist activism, you know, that test isn't necessarily right now. It's three months from now, a year, several years down the road. I've also included articles and videos below that are really worth your time about booktube, publishing, media in general, civil rights. Some of those links are from Black booktubers whose content I enjoy in general and who have talked recently about their experiences of fearing the police or fearing for their children in some cases, of racism in their daily lives and racism and complicity on booktube. If you've gotten to this part of my video and you're like, why should I care what you have to say? Fair enough, whoever you are, I, I can honestly say I got a lot out of their thoughts. And I'm also featuring some links to other videos on their channel that I've loved so that if you're new to them, you can continue exploring what they have to say and, and get a sense of the books that they talk about. I am so far from being helpful to the conversations about Black Lives Matter and how white supremacy is foundational to American society, but Black booktubers shouldn't feel like they're using their energy and eloquence to talk into the void while the rest of us truck along with our book calls and Friday reads. So this is, is my flawed and minor contribution. Actually, one last thing, this may be a weird aspect to latch onto, but as we discuss the significance of reading more Black authors, it's important to frame them the way we would white authors as artists. Plenty of booktubers do this already, but Black authors aren't just a solution to ignorance and a, a way for white readers to learn. You know, they deserve to have their books treated with the same individuality and critical attention that, that we would afford to all authors, hopefully. So, recent and current reads. I recently finished Salvage the Bones by Jasmine Ward, which I'd owned for about two years, and in that time I also read Sing Unburied Sing, which I didn't love and I discussed why in a review. I knew I wanted to get to this one within the first half of 2020 because I suspected it would be more mystic, and it is you guys, Salvage the Bones is way more impressive in my estimation. And I know I, I wasn't in the majority at the time, but Sing and Braid Sing felt oddly flat on the page. And this one is crackling, even from the more subdued beginning chapters. And from there, it builds and builds. It's told from the perspective of a teenage girl named Esh over the course of 12 days leading up to and in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, Ash and her family live in Mississippi surrounded by what's 
essentially a junkyard. They, they call the area around their house the pit. And at the beginning of the book, her brother's dog gives birth to puppies. Don't know why, I just felt the need to qualify that. The dog did not give birth to hedgehogs in case you were concerned. <laughs> there are clear indications from the beginning though that the Esh herself is pregnant. And that, along with her obsession with Greek mythology and particularly the, the Medea myth, allows for such a deep look at what it means to be maternal. Is it nurturing, protective, aggressive? Does it give a sense of fullness or of emptiness, of, of selflessness or narcissism? Is it even feminine, necessarily? As much as I liked and admired this book, Ward style still doesn't completely gel with me. And I think compared to a lot of other readers, I'm less drawn to what can be described as, as lyrical language. Her style is dripping with metaphor and imagery and it, it, it's a high risk kind of writing. I think Karen Russell similarly just doesn't completely work for me. Um, and then the, even someone like Angela Carter who's writing I, I do really love. Part of the time I'm just thinking in the back of my mind like how is this even working? How is this all so over the top and yet it feels like part and parcel of this story? And don't get me wrong, there are, are passages in Salvage the Bones that are, are beautiful and they, they occur, you know, pretty frequently. But um, Ward does just hit these wrong notes that, that wrench me out of the reading experience and make me imagine her off writing these phrases somewhere. I read this on a, a Kindle library copy, so I can't, you know, refer to individual lines the way I normally would. But that's it. Even if you're not completely in love with Salvage the Bones on the level of the line, there are plenty of other things to love. For me, the... The family story was the beating heart of it all. Esh has three brothers and her, her two older brothers especially get these, these amazing portraits and they're each maternal in their own ways. And something that was, I think, a lot more successful and, and effortless in this second book um, is the, the physicality of Ward's writing about the natural world, the mechanical world, animal bodies, human bodies. Each human body is treated with such specificity and care, and it's almost like the book is saying on a broader level, not many people or stories care about the bodies of, of people like these characters, about Black characters from forgotten communities, but this narrative cares. On a completely different note, I also just finished Love in the Afternoon by Lisa Kleppas. You guys know she's one of my favorite authors, and I love me, a Regency romance. But this is still, I think... Maybe the first book of hers that I've read cover to cover, word for word. And that's because as, as witty and delightful as her writing is, the kissing and sex scenes. You guys, the kissing and sex scenes, they are so formulaic to a comedic extent. And suddenly adjectives and adverbs are just thrown around. There was some kind of line at one point that was like, he picked her up with stunning ease and dropped her on the bed. And I was like, is it stunning? Because the book has taken a lot of time to remind us how strapping he is and how willowy and lithe-limbed she is. Um, well, I grant you that saying he picked her up with predictable ease doesn't have quite the same ring. Anyway, this is the, the fifth book in her series about the Hathaway family. Beatrix is the, the fifth and youngest child and she's unusually bright and educated and opinionated for a woman. It's almost like she's our heroine. And she starts writing letters to a young man named Christopher who's off fighting in the, in the Crimean War. Now Christopher thinks he's writing to another young woman in their social circles who is who's beautiful. And this, you know, flighty and airheaded woman doesn't care to write back. So Beatrix starts writing to Christopher under the other woman's name, and you could write the rest of the story from there. Apart from being gloriously predictable, which I mean as a compliment, it hits every beat that I wanted it to hit. This story offers an interesting look at PTSD in a time before it was a widely understood condition. And in general, Clippus has three series that I would recommend, The Wallflowers, The Ravenels, and The Hathaways, characters from all three intermingle. And I have a soft spot for the character in any particular series who's portrayed as a real oddball in the earlier books because you just know and you're waiting for them 
later down the line to get their own I'm peculiar but adorable love story. Give it to me. I'm almost finished Under the Adala Trees by Chinelo Acaparanta. This is one of those tea bear books that I've had for a little while but didn't make the first trip to move into my my shoebox of a New York apartment. I just didn't have enough space in the car. So I'm trying to get through these to decide which ones to take with me this time. And I'm about 50 pages from the end and, and still on the fence. It could go either way. This is about an 11 year old girl named Ijeoma. Um, and the story starts at the very end of the Biafran War. And at this time, Ijeoma is sent away from her life as a middle class school girl to become a house girl for a different family. And while she's there, she falls in love with another girl. The name Ijeoma in Igbo means safe journey or a good journey through life. So already the story is telling you a lot. It's a really interesting take on the stretch and influence on the limit of religion personally and societally and of what it was like to be closeted in Nigeria in the 70s and 80s. I can't speak to the, the time frame beyond this book, so I'm, I'm curious to know if and, and how that's changed. But in general, I love that there's this, this cohort of Nigerian writers that have gained a real foothold in the UK in recent years and also in, in the US. Um, people like Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, Ayubame Adebayo, Elnath and John, Chinelo Akparanza, and hopefully it means that no one person is treated as the voice of Nigeria, nor should they, because they all in different ways highlight the ethnic and linguistic and, and religious diversity of the country. Um, Adichie and Okparanza are Igbo, um, Adebayo is Yoruba, I think all three of them are, are Christian, and they also feature the, the Hausa Muslim majority in the north in their writing. I mentioned when I reviewed Stay With Me that the influence of Yoruba on the language of that book was both one of the most interesting things about it and something that created a slight cultural barrier between me and that text where I, I couldn't instinctively feel what the writer was attempting sentence to sentence. And I wouldn't want or ask it to be otherwise, but I, I was wondering if a similar thing might be happening with Under the Idolatries that, that might go away if I read more Nigerian books. Because it's that way with, with any framing adjustment. I didn't fully appreciate or feel the distinct character of a lot of Victorian language until I'd read many Victorian books from a, a bunch of different authors. But I suspect that I might find Okparanta's writing slightly jerky and flat-footed regardless. Let me try to find an example for you here. Here's one paragraph. All night I had listened to Mama's voice, not her voice in real time, but her voice in the dream, warning me about following the devil to the grave. By the time day rolled around, my mind was infested with images of graves. I had become a little like a coffin. I felt a hollowness in me and a rattling at my seams. So that aside, where she says, not her voice in real time, but her voice in the dream, the dream happened a page before. So unless you, you have some kind of amnesia, I mean, that was just, you know, unnecessary. And then that coffin comparison, the transition from graves to coffin, to her body as a coffin that's hollow and rattling at the seams, but to me, and I, I know it's hard in isolation there, but it, there's a slight strain to some of the metaphorical language in here. Beyond the, the sentence by sentence writing, I've really liked thinking about the construction of this book. Unlike Adichie's Half of a Yellow Sun, only that the very beginning of this novel is focused on the Biafran War, Ijeoma's family is on the losing side, and, and the book opens with her witnessing her father's dawning realization that the country he dreamed of will not come to be. And so you you start with that that sense of the end of things and of a, a draining away of hope. And that really complements the narrator's tone as she looks back on the subsequent period of her life when she fell in love with two women um, and what happened with those relationships and, and why each of these women made the choices that they did. Lastly, you know, as I mentioned at the top, this has been a difficult time. I'm going through stages of grief for a few different aspects of my life. And so when it's been hard to read anything else, I've been turning to grief memoirs, you know, you know how bookish people do. And um, so up next for me are Blue Nights by Joan Didion and Wave by Sonali de Renayagala. And if I feel that I can do them justice, I, I will discuss them in a future video. I hope that whatever else reading has continued to mean 
something to you and let's all self-examine and support one another. Bye guys. Thank you for watching and take care.